Good morning. Grace and peace be to each of you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is so good to be gathered together on this third Sunday of Lent. As we begin, a few reminders and announcements for you. Um, first, um, last week in the bulletin and in the narthex, there are some order forms for Easter, Easter lilies that you can reserve in memory or honor of some memory or honor of someone. Um, for Easter Sunday. The cost of each lily is $10, uh, and we'd like these reserved and paid for by April 10th so that we can pick those up for Easter Sunday the next week. So fill these out, get them back to the church office, or call the church office and let us know you'd like to reserve a lily. Also, next Sunday, March 27th at 5.30, we're going to have an intergenerational event out at the PD Wildlife Refuge. At 5.30, we'll gather. There's a beautiful little chapel by the pond with some pews. We'll have a devotion and then chance for you to take a walk, to play lawn games, to fish if you've got the license and equipment, um, and enjoy one another's company. So come, bring your kids, bring your grandkids, bring neighborhood friends, friends from other churches. We'd love to have this time together. If you'd like to leave from the church, John is going to have his bus for us and leave at 515 to go over to the PD Wildlife Refuge, just, just a few minutes from here. Also, the next week on April the 3rd is our Ants and Singers concert at 3 o'clock, and we hope that you will mark your calendar for that wonderful concert and time together. And for those in the confirmation class, Yes, we will have it this week on Tuesday at 4.15, and we look forward to continuing our time together. Here now, dear friends, God loves us and is here to meet us as we are here to meet God and worship. 
So let us join together by standing as you are able and joining in our call to worship. Everyone who thirsts, All who are hungry for righteousness. All who need the help of God. Please remain standing for our prayer of confession. The scriptures call us to turn from sinful ways and return to God, who offers mercy and pardon. Trusting in that mercy, let us call upon God who is near. Holy God, we confess we have grown complacent in our response to you. You sat before us a rich feast of blessing but we are drawn to lesser things that cannot satisfy. You call us to attend your urgent needs in the world, but we indulge our own desires. Our ways are not your ways. Our thoughts do not ascend to your thoughts. Forgive us when we fall short of your claim upon our lives. Disturb our complacency and quicken our desire for a more fruitful life. Be patient, we pray, as we amend who we are in the hope of becoming who you intend us to be. We ask this in the name of our Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. God's love is sure and steadfast, always providing a way out, a way through, a way back to God. Through the waters of baptism, we have died with Christ and are raised with him. With gratitude and faith, we will walk in the way of Christ.
may be seated. Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 1 through 9. If you wish to follow along in your pew Bible, you can do so on page 635. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you that have no money, come by and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you, because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way, and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord, that he may have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The end of the reading. We invite the kids to come forward for children's time. Good morning, everybody. So good to have you all here, whether you're invisible or visible. (laughs) This morning, I want to ask you a question. We talked about your favorite colors a few weeks ago, and I know some of you love blue and love red, love purple, and many colors, right? With colors, sometimes we associate good things and bad things and our emotions with it. Have you ever heard somebody say they're feeling a little blue? Yeah, what does that mean? Um, It means you are sad. Yeah, it means you're sad. It means you're sad. But some of us love blue. It's our favorite color, like me. What's a good thing associated with blue? The sky, yeah, water. I know the same thing of that. Um, happy day, if your cheeks um, turn like pink, and pink, that means you're happy. Yeah, pink, like pink, we can flush our cheeks when we're happy, or uh, somebody has said how beautiful we are and how wonderful we are. We get a little pink glow on our cheeks, yeah. Yeah, pink like your shirt, Grayson. Yeah, and with red, what's a good thing we associate with red? Well, that's a bad thing we sometimes associate with red. Sometimes being mad is not bad, but, you know, we feel hot and angry. Yeah, what else? Yeah, our heart. Yeah, yeah, we all have blood in our veins, and, yep. So if we, if we get really angry, we feel that pump in hard, but also when we're remembering how much we love somebody, we remember that love with red. In Lent, the season we're in, this is the season we prepare for Easter, our color is purple. So that's why you see purple on the lectern and the pulpit and our banner and then up there on the altar table. You know what things are associated with purple? What do you think about with purple? It's a cool color, yeah. Sometimes we associate it with passion and deep feeling. In the ancient world, when Jesus lived, only kings and royalty wore purple because purple is a really hard color to dye cloth, and it was really rare. 
Yeah, yeah, your, your shoes are sort of purpley. So royalty is associated with purple and passion and also the depth of love that Jesus has for us. He goes into the middle of hard things with us so that good things can happen. So that's why we have purple as our color for Lent. We feel all sorts of emotions every day, all through the week, good and hard. Just like with blue, we can feel sad, but we can also feel a sense of incredible peace and serenity, like when we look at the sky or we look at the ocean, right? When we feel bad things, hard things, and good things, God is there with us. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I hope when you encounter some hard feelings this week and some good ones, you remember Jesus is there with you, feeling good things and hard things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the gift of yourself, represented by the color purple, you are royalty, and you call us beloved daughters and sons. So we too are princes and princesses, kings and queens in your kingdom. As we go through the week when we encounter hard things, let us remember that you are there with us. And Lord, when we encounter the beauty of things, help us to rejoice with you. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
Our gospel lesson comes to us from Luke in the 13th chapter, verses 1 through 9. Listen with me for God's word. At that very time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I have found none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year, until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, come with your comfort. Come in your witness. Come fill our hearts and lives so that we may reflect Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. This week, I officiated my eighth funeral in my eight months here as your pastor. And I've only done eight because there were two people within our membership whose families had other plans and two of our beloved saints whose funeral is on hold until later in the season. It is a holy privilege to be able to walk with you in the process of loss and grief, even as you have borne uh, loss and grief in your families as well. But that privilege bears its own grief in and of itself as well. I care so much about professing God's place in the midst of our suffering and grief rightly, especially after monumental challenges in my own life that I've traveled through with God's help. I know where God is in the midst of suffering, and it's right there crying out with us. In this morning's gospel text, Jesus is is answering questions about suffering, pain, and sin in this crowd that's gathered around him, and they've come with the local news and the latest tragedy. Pilate, who's the very same one Jesus will face in his trial, has executed some Galileans as they are just attempting to offer their sacrifices to God. It's a tragedy and it's state-sanctioned violence. And they come bearing two questions for Jesus. One is that age-old question about meaningless suffering. And the other is, should not good Jews be incensed at Pilate and at the Roman Empire? But there's some currents going on beneath their questions, beneath the surface. There's a view among Jews who live a little closer to Jerusalem and closer to the temple that those Galileans out there, they're not quite as faithful Jews as we are. So this tragedy may feel a little bit to them like, well, that's sad for them, but maybe there's something about the way they're living and practice that kind of led to this tragedy. There's a relationship question here, too. What's the relationship between those Galilean Jews, of which Jesus is one, by the way, and Jews 
who are closer to the temple. There's a danger for Jesus here as he seeks to answer their questions. He's got two choices, it seems. On one end, he could appear unpatriotic or subversive if he responds in too strong a voice against the Roman Empire. On the other, he could seem unfeeling for those who have experienced loss and tragedy. I think Jesus sees this danger very clearly, which is why he responds with a question of his own. He responds by bringing those questions closer to home for the crowd that's gathered in front of them. And he reminds them in Jerusalem, there's a tower that has fallen recently and killed 18 people in its wake. You may be more willing to judge those at a distance as if the tragedy were something to do with their sinfulness, but when it's close to home, you know there was nothing that these people did to deserve this tragedy. Tragedies arrest our attention and shake us out of the complacency and the stupor we have to get through ordinary life. It reminds us of the perils of our existence, and we don't like that very much. When we observe things as, at a distance as we're so easily able to do with our 24-hour news cycle, we can protect ourselves and our lives with rationalization and false assurance about our place and our certainty and our security. The question for us is, are we building our lives on these rationalizations that allow us to get through the day feeling like we are blessed and safe and able to presume a future and better fortune than those undergoing suffering? Or will we build our lives on the knowledge that God wants to transform us by grace, not only in the midst of our own loss, suffering, and pain, but transform us for the sake of the world, the kind of transformation that leads to generosity and compassion for those who are having a tough time. Jesus speaks about how life's frailty gives it urgency and purpose. He, he takes the matter one step further. It seems that we've been posing the question the wrong way. The surprising thing is not that so many die, but that we are still alive, that we still have a chance to bear fruit. Instead of assigning causality to others' misfortune, Jesus is saying, ensure that you don't miss the own missing fruit within your own life. And so he tells the parable of the fig tree. I think we can all agree, fig trees exist to bear fruit. Fig trees are there so we can reach up and pluck a ripe fig and enjoy its juicy, tender flesh. And so we zoom in on this conversation between a gardener and the owner of the vineyard. And it's not reasonable for the owner to expect that the tree ought to bear fruit. And it's not cruel that he plans to use the tree for firewood if it's not using the precious soil well. And the gardener, too, is not necessarily kinder than the owner or more patient. He perhaps knows some things about gardening and tending to plants that the owner himself does not know. And maybe he's realizing he should have tended that tree with a little more care and fertilizer all along. The goal of both the vineyard owner and the gardener is to harvest fruit from this tree. And so, too, our continued purpose in life is to bear fruit for the world. Picture yourself in a vineyard, looking at this beautiful fig tree alive with life and its beautiful green leaves. As you're gazing at the tree, maybe there's some grapevines behind you that have already yielded their harvest for the season. 
At this time, you'd expect the figs to be ready when the grapes are done. But to a casual observer, they might look at this tree, this beautiful tree standing in front of us and see, ah, this tree is so valuable. It's treated with such care. It's never been pruned. It's nice and beautiful and green, and now the gardener's gonna give it extra fertilizer. Oh, how valuable this tree. And then glance around at the grapevines behind us that have been severely pruned down to dry and gnarly stumps and think, oh, well, those, those need to be given up on. But we know the truth is the opposite here. This tree is receiving care because it has yet to bear the fruit it was intended to bear. None of us escapes life without suffering, grief, and pain. We are, after all, limited, fragile, and vulnerable creatures with competing resources and ideas of what the good life looks like. But some of us never do the hard work of meeting God in our loss, in our suffering, in our grief. And so, like the fig tree, we've missed out on the fruit God has to offer us. There are all sorts of losses in life. Sudden tragedies befall our families. We experience the loss of unexpected future, whether to death or illness or divorce. And we experience horrible circumstances like a parent bearing a child and the trauma of abuse. But even across a normal life, there's loss and transition we expect. Those who graduate from high school can experience great loss of their emotional support network and relationality that they're used to getting through their high school years. When our children grow up and become less dependent on us, it's a loss of its own. We expect those older than us, our parents and our grandparents, to die before us, but that expected loss is so hard on our lives. Whatever kind of loss we're experiencing, loss is loss. And what is insignificant for one person can be catastrophic for another. For example, I had a friend who lost one of her pet cats in a really tragic manner. It was horrible. But the thing she told me she was really grieving, that, that her grief ballooned around, was that when she went to put out cat treats in the morning, she was putting out two piles and not three. And so every time she put out cat treats, that grief just rose up fresh and raw. And all those around her just kept saying, why aren't you over that already? Oh, a loss is a loss, and we need to be able to feel our feelings and process it at our own rate. In Western Christianity, many of us mistakenly believe that our grief will somehow slow us down or hinder us in accomplishing the mission God has set for us. But really, like the fig tree and the grapes, the opposite is true. Pete Schizero, who wrote Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, wrote this. He said, God was seeking to enlarge my soul and deeply transform me. I was seeking a quick end to pain. I saw losses as obstacles I had to overcome in order to mature in Christ. God saw my losses as requirements to mature in Christ. Little did I know that there are treasures buried deep in my sorrows, and they contained the gifts I needed to grow into an emotional and spiritual adult. It was the last place I wanted to go. Brothers and sisters, losses that we do not grieve accumulate in our soul like rocks that weigh us down. And until we are willing to learn to feel and process our emotion, then 
the revelation and treasure and God's way of grieving is lost to us. Pete Scazzaro suggests three stages of processing our grief in Christ. They are pay attention to our pain, wait in the confusing in between, and allow the old to birth the new. Pay attention to the pain, wait in the confusing in between, and allow the old to birth the new. It's difficult for us to pay attention to pain. We, we want to just move on with our day and our life. But we have great many biblical models for this, but I'll just mention two. One is King David, who we know experienced many losses, disappointments, challenges, and even the pain of realizing his own need to repent. What he did with this is to write songs and to sing them back to God. We're recording them in the Psalms, and we can access them too when we need to lament and grieve. I always think it's funny when somebody says, my favorite book of the Bible is Psalms. <laughs> there are many Psalms of comfort and praise and beauty and trust, but one half to two thirds of our 150 Psalms are ones of lament and crying out to God not understanding where God is or what God's up to, and yet trust. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus models for us what it means to feel and process our deep emotion. In that moment, Jesus anguished and sorrowed, and he was spiritually overwhelmed, even the very Son of God among us. What he was not, though, was emotionally frozen or shut down. When we try to lock our pain and grief away and not deal with them, eventually those things find a way to crawl back out. It might be in depression or anxiety, loneliness and despair, or even physical illness. But the depths where we are afraid to go with our emotion and grief and pain, Jesus is already there waiting for us. He went before us in the Garden of Gethsemane. Pete Scazzaro recommends something he calls feeling workouts, which I think are interesting. Every day he sits down at the end of the day and he takes a, a stock of his body and his emotion and he reflects on where he feels tension in his body. So you, you may feel some of that in your body where you are. Your jaw clenched, or your shoulders tight, or you've wrenched your hips together. Let it out. Our body often knows what we feel before our brains have really caught up to it. And so by paying attention to our body, we can ask curious questions about why we're feeling that pain, anxiety, tension, and ask God to speak to us through those things. What's interesting is that by giving God access to these harder emotions in our life, we actually experience a wider, fuller range of emotion we start to experience astonishment and joy and delight that we've missed out on. I really commend to you the author Kate Bowler. She's a professor at Duke Divinity School. She was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer not too much before I was diagnosed with my cancer. And she still struggles and lives in the beautiful in-between. She's got a great new book out of devotions called Good Enough. <laughs> and one of them she writes, Some people will try to tell you to just choose joy, as if reframing your perspective will make things hurt less. I wish I could tell you that joy was a magic formula. But no matter how joyful you choose to act, joy does not erase the pain. Some things cannot be canceled out, but you are capable of a whole range of emotions that can coexist. 
joy and sorrow, grief and delight, laughter and despair. Sometimes the absurdity even keeps us afloat. When we access our pain, we, we move into waiting and the confusing in between. In this moment, we're not always sure where God is, what God's up to, and if, if or when the waiting will ever end. It feels like it stretches on out before us to infinity. St. John of the Cross in the 16th century called this a dark night of the soul. Have you ever heard this phrase, dark night of the soul? This is where you feel helpless and weary empty, confused by failure or defeat. And sometimes you don't even know or feel that God is there. But when we fall into trusting God in these confusing in-between times, we discover God is working underneath the surface in ways we cannot yet discern. I love the beauty of Jesus after his death on the cross, he's in the tomb for three days. I don't think that's any accident. His disciples and we need time to process the enormity of our loss, all of the things we're giving up, the expected future that we have that is now gone, and to be able to be open then to the work of resurrection on the third day. But nothing is wasted, not even the dark night of the soul. God uses them for our benefit, for God's glory, and for the good of others. Eventually, we find that God births anew out of what has been gone. This does not diminish our loss or make it okay, but our losses are real but so is the resurrection that God brings from our losses. I want to say very clearly, God does not need another angel. God is not testing our capacity to handle one more thing that God is entrusting us with. Life itself, even one breath, is more than we can handle without the love of God and without the sustenance of God. This beautiful, vulnerable, fragile existence we have runs us into each other and runs us into tragedy. But the God we serve comes to us, compassion and love embodied in Jesus Christ, here to share our suffering and sorrow and walk with us all the way through to the other side. And Jesus goes to the cross to say a final no to sin and death and suffering and loss. I've been captivated over the last few years by a line from Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous I Have a Dream speech. He said, with this faith, we will be able to hew out of a mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of a mountain of despair a stone of hope. When we trust God with our loss and our pain, we find great treasures, a stone of hope in this mountain of despair. We find a God who is more loving and gracious than we ever imagined. We find that more of our true self emerges and those things we thought defined us can fall away. In our emptiness, God brings life and fruitfulness and joy. And in those hard moments, we've become more fully alive to the beauty of this fragile world. The good news extends far beyond this stone of hope. God does not leave us to our own devices to struggle on our own. Everything possible is being done to urge our fruitfulness. God wants to transform us by God's grace. If we're willing, we may be pruned 
like the grapevine, so that we may bear greater fruitfulness and health and flourishing. And if we're not yet ready, then God digs around our roots and applies a healthy dose of fertilizer, giving us time and patience to grow and flourish. By the grace of God, we will, even in the midst of loss, we will encounter and bear fruit. And we will hew a stone of hope out of the mountain of despair. There are a few ways you can respond to God's invitation to trust God with your loss and your pain and your grief. If you are going through a tough time, whether that's divorce or grief or a health situation that you'd like to process with a group, or you're interested in a workshop about how to deal with grief and loss, in the narthex there's a sign-up sheet for you. I'm gauging your interest about what kinds of activities we need to do to support one another. So if you're interested, let me know, the church office know, or put your name out there in the narthex on the sheet. Also, in this wonderful, beautiful church, we have so many dedicated people who meet families after losses and grief, and they offer a meal and space for families to visit. And they are looking for more people to help. <laughs> so even if you haven't been asked before, men and women, <laughs> if you're willing to help prepare a, a side dish or you're willing to help be present to serve those families, I invite you to put your name out there on the sign-up sheet or to tar talk to Barbara Tal Tarleton for more. And thirdly, this morning, I offer you the gift of oil for healing. If you'd like to be anointed, you can come forward during the final hymn or after our service has ended, and I'll be glad to anoint you in this moment. As we turn to God in prayer, we have so many needs to lift up in our community. We continue to pray for Lib Huntley and Nancy Huntley, Chuck Kaiser, Nancy Warren. We lift up all those who are fighting cancer, including Luann Davis, Gail Runkel, Harvey Levitt, and a guest with us this morning, Terry. And this morning, we remember and mourn the loss of Kelly Green Petrill, especially her mom, Vicki, um, as they have recently endured another loss as well. I have, do have a joy to share with you. In February, some of you were here when I was on vacation, and Lena Davis Harvey was here to offer a message, and um, she had her baby girl on Friday night. Her name is Hallie Jo. She is five pounds and 12 ounces. She came a little earlier due to high blood pressure, but she and mom are doing well and overjoyed, and she is just the cutest. If you want to see a picture, I'm not her mom, but I'm happy to pull it up on Facebook and show you. She is beautiful. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. God of generous provision, we are grateful for the many ways you care for us and provide for the needs of your people. In word, water, bread, and wine, you nourish and sustain us. When we listen to you, we encounter delight, and when we come to you, we live most fully. Sometimes, though, we find ourselves in a dry and weary land, in places torn apart by war, where earth itself has been ravaged, where hospitals and homes and corner stores have been reduced to rubble, where human lives have been destroyed and deformed, where peace lies in the ruins and hope is buried. O oh God, raise peace among us again. Build hope up from the ground. Restore in us and in the world's leaders the will and determination to make an end of war and a new beginning for justice. Sometimes we find ourselves in a dry and weary land when we are lost, unable to find our way to a place that is home for us, when we are sad and weighed down with regret or grief, when we are tired or sick in body, mind, or spirit. 
O God, provide water in the desert and manna in the wilderness, enough to sustain us for one more day, or even enough to revive us for the long haul. But sometimes, Lord, we find ourselves in the rich feast of your presence. We enjoy the relief of forgiveness given and received. We enjoy a breach in walls of division. Those moments when our own hearts are enlarged and our own vision is broadened by new understanding. When we welcome a prodigal home or ourselves welcomed home again. Oh God, we thank you that you are reconciling all things in heaven and on earth. Be patient with us, we pray, in the varied landscapes of our lives. Make us patient with one another and even with ourselves. Do your good work within us, among us, and beyond us too, until our lives and all of creation come fully into your realm. You who so generously provide deserve our praise, our grateful praise. So in Jesus' name we pray as he teaches us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Disciples of Jesus, we often spend our money and our labor on things that do not satisfy. But in our offering, we give things that are of God, bread for the hungry, good news for the oppressed, and ministries of the church that welcome strangers and sons and daughters alike. We bring before God a portion of what God has so freely given to us. We ask the ushers and choir to come forward.
promised land. In days of want and in days of plenty, you have been with us. By these gifts we now share, may others know of your providence and care. Send us not only our offerings, but our very selves, to console and comfort, to lift up and reach out, to listen and sit beside your children everywhere at the one table you have set. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, in the midst of loss and pain and grief, we are invited to pay attention to our pain, to offer that to the God who has gone already to the depths and to the other side, to wait in the confusing in-between and wait for God to birth the new from the old. God's promises of resurrection are good and true and sure. So go in the midst of peace that passes all understanding. Amen. <laughs> 